have our very own Joan Kuhabu, who is a faculty member in art and in anthropology. And she has been really busy, but not here the last <laughs> couple of years. She is, uh, while she's a professor here, she took, I guess, an official leave and spent two and a half, two years, two and a half years over in Japan doing a range of pro uh, projects. Um, and I think we're going to hear at least about part of it because I'm sure she did more than just what she's going to talk about today. This was a very a, a large and engaged project, but I know many of us have been keen to find out what what at least some of the things were. So we're very lucky to have her here. So please welcome John Cole. Oh, Christine, thank you very much. And uh, I have to warn you, in fact, I'd like to talk not only about my Jomon case study, but also about other sub-projects under the big project. So you may think I'm a bit crazy with all the sub-projects, but hopefully it makes sense to you. And uh, I want to start uh, with uh, a little bit of why I decided to do this project that, as most of you know, my speciality is Jomon archaeology, the Jomon culture, is uh, <coughs> the prehistoric hunter-gatherer culture from about 16,000 to 2,500 um, years ago. Uh, it's often cited as an example of so-called complex hunter-gatherers like California and Northwest Coast uh, <coughs> native uh, <coughs> hunter-gatherers. And uh, um, it's a great opportunity to study the correlation between sedentism, subsistence intensification, social complexity, and there's a large amount of archaeological data. And I have to tell you, um, Japanese archaeology is not only about uh, the great data source, it's also so closely tied to the social political context that history of post-Second World War archaeology in Japan is closely tied to rapid economic development uh, for the past 50 years or so. Building trains, bullet trains, um, freeways, dams, houses, there were always archaeological excavations. So my first excavation goes back to 1969 <laughs> when I was 10 years old. And I have to emphasize I beat Pat Kutch for starting my archaeology a bit earlier than he did. <laughs> That's what I said at my job interview, and I almost didn't get this job. <laughs> but Pat was kind enough to accept that. So this was uh, 1969. Um, <clears throat> My first excavation, that was a time when there's so many, um, there were so many uh, <laughs> land developments uh, in the suburb of the Tokyo um, area. So pretty much um, all the archaeological sites in the suburbs of Tokyo were either destroyed or excavated. And Japan has this law that emphasizes that all the um, archaeological sites dated to before the mid-19th century um, need to be excavated, whether it's on the private land or public land. So um, up to the mid-1990s, when uh, Japanese economy was still growing, archaeologists were able to do rescue excavations for the entire um, site area. This is an example of um, uh, a large-scale excavation that a baseball stadium, um, a planned baseball stadium area, turned out to be a uh, a large Jomon site. And uh, we were able to preserve this site with the help of uh, local residents. But that was up to 1990s that the economy in Japan is much more grim right now. That this is probably one of the um, last really large scale excavation prior to a dam construction. This is the best final Jomon site, waterlogged with all the organic remains. But uh, there's very little preservation movement. Uh, many archaeologists are actually afraid to speak up <laughs> that this site needs to be preserved because um, of the pressure from the government. So um, Japanese archaeology looks quite grim. That uh, this shows. Um, uh, shows. The total excavation cost um, that um, 
the peak was in the mid 1990s. Now um, we get less than half of um, what we used to be able to use. Admittedly, this is all for rescue excavation, but this also means there are less jobs in Japan that uh, <coughs> Uh, the number is going up a little bit because of the conservative government pouring in more money for construction again, but it won't last. So after the Tokyo Olympic in 2020, guaranteed there'll be um, <clears throat> less positions in Japan. This really shows a paradox of Japanese archeology. span It did make a lot of uh, <clears throat> Um, fantastic discoveries, large-scale excavations, but that was so closely tied to the destruction of the environment, landscape, and archaeological sites. So up to the 80s, archaeologists basically said, well, there's not much else we can do. All we can do is to take part of the rescue excavation so that at least we can preserve the record. But the more I think about that, um, the more I began to think, I don't want to be part of the site that are always working with large construction companies that are always destroying archaeological sites. So I began to think what I can do with the archaeological data that I have. And uh, that be big baseball stadium site, the Sanai Maruyama site, uh, is um, uh, a great uh, opportunity for us to understand long-term changes and um, was occupied for about 1,600 years. And there what I saw was a gradual uh, <coughs> subsistence uh, specialization focusing more on plant food is what I think. And uh, um, how that was tied to population increase and decrease. And when I talked about that to um, people working on um, <coughs> environmental issues today. When I said uh, subsistence intensification, very few people are interested in it. But when I said, well, the loss of food diversity, then all of a sudden, people working on contemporary uh, issues said, oh, that is very interesting. So that made me think that, OK, that might be a way to go to explain the importance of my work to um, non-archaeologists. And uh, uh, part of uh, my research interest uh, that I'm going to talk about today is closely tied to what happens when people lose food diversity. Um, how is it tied to uh, the resilience of society and how that are tied to population size, mobility of people, goods, and information, which I think are all closely tied to the development of social inequality. So um, looking at contemporary issues, a lot of people are talking about the importance of um, local autonomy, diversity, and network, um, which I think um, can be tied back to what we can learn from archaeological data. That um, what I want to say through my archaeological data is that when people lose food diversity, and when people think that it's the best way to do things efficiently, for a short period, it may work. But in the long run, unless you have some backup plans, you can make a very vulnerable system to minor um, or major um, environmental disasters or um, <clears throat> other triggers. And uh, that, I think, is also relevant to um, the Japanese society today, uh, that this is a population estimate. There's a lot of debate about what's going to happen to Japan in the next um, half a century. That the population peak hit um, was 2010. And in the next 50 years, um, it will be down to less than 100 million. And uh, in a little bit more 100 years, we may be back to the level of even the 19th century. Um, so, um, and this is because there are very few immigrants coming into Japan, and I think uh, this um, um, is, there's a lot of debate about the current situation, and particularly the political situation, what happened to this country yesterday. I think um, a lot of people are concerned what's going to happen in the long run in uh, this country and in different parts of the world. 
And uh, Japan has its own unique situation, but in the big picture, I think uh, what Japan is facing in terms of environment, population, food supply. Um, <coughs> so um, what I want to say is archaeology can help to think about these issues. So with that in mind, uh, I applied for a three-year project in Japan they titled Long-Term Sustainability Through Place-Based Small-Scale Economies, Approaches from Historical Ecology. And uh, we got about $2 million for three years. I got very excited, and I thought I could do a lot. So I split it up into many sub-projects. What I didn't realize was that the Japanese government's bureaucratic systems are so complicated. <laughs> So um, splitting them up into smaller projects means a lot of administrative work. <laughs> and uh, um, I think I learned my lesson, but I'm not regretting because I learned so much from individual <laughs> sub-projects. Um, so it's divided into three groups. The first one is what we call long durée group um, <clears throat> that deals with archaeology and paleoenvironmental studies. The second one is contemporary society group, and the third one is implementation outreach and policy proposal groups. The goal of this project is to examine the importance of small scale and diversified economies, especially food production for long term sustainability, um, to examine the correlation between food diversity, scale of economy and community, and resilience of human environmental interaction, and based on the results, to make construction suggestions for a sustainable future. And the theoretical background um, is coming from mainly historical ecology, but also from related fields, with an emphasis of human impacts on the environment and anthropogenic landscapes, emphasis on historically unique trajectories of human sociopolitical systems in different parts of the world, and processes operating at different temporal scales from short-term events to long-term changes. And when I say long-term, I'm talking at least um, hundreds um, of years, if not um, more. And when I say small-scale economy, a lot of people say, well, what they're talking about, the world is a global society that um, everything is connected. What's the point of talking about small-scale um, <coughs> economy? But um, I'm not saying that um, we should establish an isolated small scale economy. Um, of course, we know that it's connected to the global economy. But um, the range of networks that enable food production, distribution, and consumption um, um, in a given locality without precluding links to the outside economy. That through our research, we talk to a lot of um, people who are living in. Um, relatively rural um, environment, those um, who are um, <coughs> um, working in uh, um, <coughs> traditional communities, of course they're connected to the rest of the world. And uh, um, when we're talking about archaeological um <coughs> society and community scale, of course we know that they are all connected to the rest of the world. So um, <coughs> we um, put a lot of emphasis on three concepts, diversity, networks, and sovereignty or local autonomy, all, um, which are all linked to the issue of scale. And from there, we can talk about sustainability and resilience, environmental management and landscape, and the role of traditional ecological knowledge. So um, this was a diagram, a um, little bit modified, but basically the diagram that I was using when I talked about archaeological um, data. And uh, by emphasizing the importance of diversity, network, um, scale, <coughs> and local autonomy, uh, <coughs> we can make this as a <coughs> diagram from a very objective description of what happened in the past to um, something that we can really emphasize the importance of particular aspects of uh, <coughs> um, contemporary society. We are also looking at uh, the adaptive cycle model or coming from resilience theory that um, <coughs> the resilience theory emphasizes the phase from exploitation um, to the rapid growth, to conservation, 
which and then lead to the release of uh, the um, phase where you often see population decrease and then the reorganization phase. And uh, it's according to the model, the shift from conservation to release is inevitable, but that doesn't mean that the change has to be catastrophic. So how can we make it as a soft landing and uh, think about uh, <coughs> the um, next phase? That's what we need to do in contemporary society. And uh, to do that, archaeology has the strength to really look at long-term changes. Um, our data are coming from both sides of the Pacific Rim, um, mainly from Northeast and Japan and the West Coast of North America. Although um, we've got several sub-projects that are not really fitting into this um, context, but the big part of our data coming from the two areas and uh, um, Japan and comparative studies mainly from the West Coast of North America for the three groups. And uh, <coughs> the long degree group um, with a focus on food and subsistence diversity, human impacts on the environment and demography. For Japan, um, we have several locations, but our um, big focus is uh, on Aomori Prefecture, where I've been working on uh, archaeological data from Aomori Prefecture for the past uh, almost 20 years. And for um, the West Coast, uh, our Kent Lightfoot is doing uh, archaeological work on Point Reyes and Onion Level um, <coughs> National Historic Park. And we've got Ken Ames working on Lower Columbia River area, uh, Colin Greer um, from uh, Gulf Islands. And we also have data from Canadian Arctic from Jim Savelle at McGill. So um, first I want to show where we are at with my archeology span um, at um, Sanae Maruyama and its vicinity. And I'll see how much time I have to explain the rest of the project. So for Sanai Maruyama um, and uh, other sites in Aomori Prefecture, um, we take that as a great opportunity to examine short and long-term changes in human environmental interaction. We started with a hypothesis that a highly specialized uh, subsistence strategies can support a larger population for a short period. But a decrease in subsistence diversity makes society more vulnerable in the long run. And this hypothesis is coming from um, the Jomon data that shows a steady population increase up to the middle Jomon, but a decline from the middle Jomon to the late Jomon. Admittedly, this, is, um, this simulation is based on a number of assumptions. It was done. Um, almost 30 years ago, so um, it's about the time to redo this population estimate. But the general trend I don't think will change much. When we look at the uh, uh, population history on the Japanese archipelago, you see that um, there are only four times that we see major population decrease, and the Jamon, middle Jamon is the first one. So um, to understand the mechanisms of how did, um, this happened um, can really help to think about uh, the demography in Japan and uh, um, in other parts of the world, not only about hunter-gatherer society, but um, to think about the correlations between uh, food um, <coughs> diversity, food and subsistence diversity, uh, <coughs> population, and uh, uh, <coughs> other factors. So the Sanai Maruyama site um, is on the northern tip of the main island of uh, <coughs> Japan. As I said, it was supposed to have been a baseball stadium, but uh, <coughs> the local people took pride of the fact that this site was found uh, in their hometown. So it is currently a national historic park and they're trying to get into the list of uh, World Heritage Sites together with several other Jomon sites. Now, the site occupation uh, lasted from about 5,900 to um, 4,300 um, years ago. 
And a lot of people said, well, the end of the site occupation um, coincide with the cooling climate, the so-called 4.3K um, <coughs> um, event, uh, the bond, it, bond three event. So um, a lot of people said cooling climate was the cause of the population decrease at the site. And interestingly enough, um, <coughs> the end of the site occupation also coincide with the timing when we see uh, <coughs> the end of many other large settlement occupation in the area um, all the way to northeastern half of Japan. In the big picture, um, it looks convincing that um, these bars show uh, <coughs> AMS dates from Sanai Maruyama up to 2004. And it seems to be um, <coughs> about right, well, 4.2K or 4.3K event uh <coughs> that is shown um, from the data of ice core temperature. But uh, when we started looking at the data, we realized that, wait a second, the end of the site occupation might be around that time, but a major decrease in the number of pit dwellings occurred much earlier. Number two, even if climate change was related to this, we still need to explain how did it happen. So I started looking at uh, lithic assemblage data, um, <coughs> the number, changes in the number of pit dwellings, and uh, changes in ritual artifacts, um, such as clay figurines. One limitation of Sanai Maruyama data is that um, the site um, um, has very um, uneven preservation conditions, that we do have faunal and floral data from the uh, <coughs> first half of the site occupation up to uh, up to here. But for the part where you see really a large number of pit dwellings, the preservation condition um, of organic remains is um, <coughs> unfortunately very bad, that we do not have um, <coughs> macro, floral, and faunal remains uh, from uh, here on. So um, that gives us uh, <coughs> difficult situation to rely solely on faunal and floral remains analysis. So what do we have instead is uh, the lithic assemblage data that um, we can look at changes through time all the way to the end of the site occupation. So looking at this, uh, <coughs> the first thing you can notice is that the number of pit dwellings go up and down and uh, even though Sanai Maruyama is known as the largest Jomon settlement. In fact, uh, <coughs> for each phase, uh, <coughs> the only two phases that are associated with definitely more than 50 pit dwellings is um, uh, only two phases, upper ento E and uh, um, upper ento D. And uh, uh, <coughs> the second thing that I noticed was the lithic assemblage characteristics changed dramatically, that initially the site was associated with uh, <coughs> a lot of flake tools, um, such as stem scrapers, which a lot of people thought were used um, for processing fish. And then you see a gradual increase in the um, proportion of what we call grinding stones, which we think are plant food processing tools. And then there are uh, three phases with just grinding stones pretty much dominating the uh, <coughs> lithic assemblage. And all of a sudden, pretty much all the grinding stones disappeared. And uh, we do have a lot of arrowheads. And there's a little bit of um, shift back to the grinding stone site at the Saibana phase. But eventually, um, <coughs> grinding stones pretty much all disappeared. And uh, <coughs> That's the end of the site occupation. So just give you the sense. Um, initially, we had all these. And then we started to get a lot of grinding stones. And then we had several phases with just grinding stones. And then all of a sudden, they all disappeared. And the patterns are, um, are shown nicely in this correspondence analysis. Um, we don't even actually need stats like this. That If you look at the graphs, it's pretty clear. Um, how the lithic assemblage changed. And the pattern is robust. So in terms of archaeological uh, <coughs> findings, 
We see changes in lithic assemblage occurred first at uh, <coughs> the transition from upper end of D to E, then followed by decrease in settlement size and decrease in the number of clay figurines. So if we take uh, the characteristics of lithic assemblage as a reflection of uh, subsistence activities, then um, we could interpret this that the loss of food and subsistence diversity occurred first, and then followed by the reduction in settlement size and changes in rituals. So this was where I was at before I went to Japan. And we had lots of samples from Sana and Maruyama. And uh, we took a lot of um, <coughs> soil samples for pollen analysis and others. We didn't have enough money to process everything. And we are also really short of AMS dates. So the first thing I did was to run um, AMS dates um, from um, different parts of the site that can be tied back to uh, pottery phases so that we can nail down the dates. And uh, this is an example of um, AMS dates coming from this particular uh, column which are dated to the um, early half of the site occupation. And as you can see, um, with the Bayesian calibration, uh, it lines up quite nicely that we are able to nail down the end of early Jamon at around 53.50 calibrated BP, which is um, slightly older than what people thought of. And we had samples from several other sites, um, including uh, Sanai Maruyama number nine site um, this was another waterlogged um, site. And for this one, we actually had waterlogged layers from the middle Jomon as opposed to the early Jomon. So um, this partially compensate um, the lack of uh, uh, faunal and floral data um, from Sanai Maruyama proper. So um, with several other samples like this, um, we were able to get much better resolution um, for chronology that uh, the beginning of the site occupation doesn't change. Uh, the end of the early Jumon, uh, um, that uh, we were able to nail that down. Uh, what we just saw was coming right up here at the end of this. And then uh, this part seems to be much shorter than many people thought of. And, uh, um, the peak of the population um, was probably around 4,900. And then we see a decline over there. So that's about 500, 600 years before a 4.3K event hit um, this area. So uh, the interpretation that a 4.3K event was the cause of a major population decline, looking at this data, um, it, um, it looks like that a major population decline occurred several hundred years before the major cooling climate hit Japan. Now, um, in the process of doing this, we also had a lot of talk with a, a, a person who is an oxygen isotope specialist and who's very interested in the impacts of a long-term um, climate change versus short-term climate change. And as most of you know, 4.3K event, um, that is a large scale, a major trend. And uh, um, one of the things that we wanted was more fine grained um, environmental data. And uh, um, I was really hoping that the oxygen isotope data from tree rings um, would be on time. But uh, the guy is, uh, he is actually very busy with a uh, later period right now. So we probably have to wait for a while. In the meanwhile, um, we um, were able to obtain a marine core from um, Hokkaido, um, the southern part of Hokkaido. So that is actually very close to our um, excavation um, and uh, um, to our Sanai Maruyama site. So um, we were able to get alkanon, sea surface temperature, and pollen data from there. And as you can see, uh, this uh, the bottom half. Um, from there on are all um, different kinds of uh, <coughs> simulation of uh, um, uh, <coughs> temperature data based on pollen. 
the top part shows um, alkanon sea surface temperature um, <coughs> data. And as you can see, 4.3K um, is shown clearly in all the different kinds of simulation based on um, pollen. So that's good. And that matches with the decline if with the sea surface temperature um, up there. So um, <coughs> this shows a fairly clear pattern of 4.3K. Now, um, what is intriguing me right now is that um, this dent actually seems to be matching with our uh, <coughs> Sanae Maruyama data around 4,900 years ago. Um, see the disappearance of all the um, grinding stones. So um, I haven't ruled out climate uh, <coughs> um, closely tied to uh, <coughs> the changes at Sanae Maruyama but um, at least it should be separated from 4.3K event. In relation to that, uh, we were able to do uh, uh, another type of simulation study about Jomon population on the basis of uh, solely on AMS dates from Japan. Now, Japan is notorious for, uh, Japanese archaeology is really notorious for too much concerned about pottery chronology. And the uh, AMS dates were not um, actively adopted by Japanese archaeologists until the late 1990s. I remember that in the early 90s, several scholars from Europe came to Japan and asked, why don't you guys use C14 dates? And Japanese archaeologists are so proud, and they said, no, pottery chronology is better. <laughs> So um, that was up until um, the mid-1990s, but the discovery of the earliest um, pottery in Japan um, with AMS dates, um, it turned out to be about 15,000 or 16,000 years ago. That made many scholars think it's actually useful. So once that happened, um, many rescue excavations started to do at least um, a couple of AMS dates. So um, Enrico Crema from um, Cambridge uh, did a simulation on the basis of only C14 dates, and uh, um, it's, um, it's a neat statistical technique. And uh, um, of course, if you have a lot of MS dates from the same layer, or from the same context, then you count that as one. And initially, I didn't think it would show any meaningful patterns. I thought the sample um, <coughs> distribution is still too biased, that we, I know that MS dates are coming from still a very limited number of sites. So I didn't think it would show um, clear patterns, but it actually did. And it did match quite nicely with the pottery data that we have. So the left side um, is the uh, um, <coughs> results for the Kanto region, which is central part of Japan, near Tokyo, where we know that a um, large number of large settlements are really concentrated in, uh, um, during the middle Jomon period. So we see a uh, <coughs> rapid population increase and decrease, which matches with the middle Jomon peak um, for uh, Aomori, it's showing a different pattern, but um, this doesn't um, take the size of site into account. So this really shows how the number of sites changed in Aomori prefecture, the northern part of Japan, where Sanai Moriyama site is located. So it did increase um, from 6,000 to um, about 5,300. That matches with uh, the early Jomon part. The first dent matches with uh, the first dent that we see at Sanae Maruyama in terms of the number of pit dwellings. That also matches with the regional trend. The <coughs> second dent matches with that 4,900 um, BP um, uh, <coughs> the, uh, that we just saw at Sanae Maruyama. And the third dent matches with uh, the end of the middle Jomon. And the last big dent is coming to the middle part of the late Jomon. So um, this, 
does not take the site size into account. So if we um, do simulation with site size, then the population estimate itself will be different. But this really shows that actually um, <coughs> this kind of analysis can be really helpful. And uh, um, the fact that people are talking about uh, <coughs> major um, decrease in site size and population estimate, that traditionally scholars have been mixing up uh, these three dents together and really um, <coughs> not making a major, um, <coughs> um, not making contrast with what was happening in the central part of Japan. But with the data um, like this, it looks like we have a lot of possibilities to um, talk about really fine-grained changes through time. Uh, one more uh, <coughs> exciting result that we got is uh, residue analysis of pottery that um, Oliver Craig at York um, did analysis of Sanai Maruyama, and we just got this out in the journal of Japan Japanese Journal of Archaeology. And uh, um, Kevin did the second round of analysis that we are waiting for the results um, to be coming in sometime soon. But uh, <coughs> the red dots show um, pottery, and uh, the blue ones are showing charred remains from Sanai Maruyama. And uh, the charred remain part is actually a separate story, but I'm um, focusing on the red part. Initially, we thought we don't see much differences, but after the paper got published, Oliver Craig actually said that where well, we do have the separation between the early Jomon data and the middle Jomon data, and the early Jomon one shows more marine-oriented food. The sample size is still small, but if we can get that um, <coughs> um, confirmed with more data, then um, that um, could be really helpful in terms of understanding um, <coughs> changes in food diversity at Sanai Maruyama. And uh, the blue part is a different story, but um, these are charred samples like these. Um, uh, initially, we thought they were coming from the inside of pottery, but uh, <coughs> when we looked at the samples, um, they um, really show, uh, initially we were looking for parenchyma, but um, it really looked more like uh, very fibery. Some looked like even basket remains or something. And uh, um, the results showed that these were all plant only. So clearly these are different from um, <coughs> the pottery residue. And this is a mystery right now, but uh, <coughs> we are also very excited to get that kind of result. So um, <coughs> we <coughs> have a lot of ongoing projects from uh, <coughs> fine-grained chronology based on C14 dates, um <coughs> examination of data on climate change, residue analysis, and uh, we are still waiting for the results of GIS analysis of settlement patterns and uh, uh, <coughs> uh, pollen analysis at each site. The stable isotope analysis of human skeletal remains is a bit tricky one that we do not have many skeletal remains from Aomori per se. So what we can say is much more um, <coughs> coarse grained uh, <coughs> temporal changes from the early Jomon to the final Jomon. We have more actually late and final Jomon data. Um, <coughs> we, what we really want at this point, um, there's a couple of more lines of evidence, including starch grains analysis and white lith analysis of stone tools, that the Japanese group working on um, starch grains analysis are very conservative, that they are not um, um, doing taxa level ident identification, that they are mainly looking at uh, <coughs> classifying them into different types, which will still be okay in terms of looking at changes in diversity. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, Luli and uh, others uh, working at Stanford and uh, Australia, the Canadian teams, they are much more aggressive in terms of identifying starch grains. So um, I'm hoping that there'll be more uh, discussion between the two groups. Working on this project made me think that um, 
we do need more information about the process of when did the subsistence um, specialization or shift more towards plant food occur? How did it occur? And uh, um, to think about that, um, <coughs> I began to re-examine data um, in terms of community layout, oops, there are two T's, sorry, rituals and craft specializations, which um, <coughs> that traditionally Japanese archaeologists tended to say that Jomon was pretty much egalitarian, a little bit of evidence of social inequality for the late and final Jomon. On the other hand, when we look at uh, <coughs> archaeological data from the northwest coast, what's been interpreted as emergent so um, evidence of emergent social complexity can be found as early as in the early Jomon when we see the shift, um, um, <coughs> the population increase and the shift towards plant. Um, cultivation. So um, I think this is about the time that we look at the data for the transition from the early Jomon to middle Jomon again, and uh, we think about the possibility of interpretations. Okay, I've got about 10 minutes left, so obviously I don't have much time left to talk about other parts, just to give you the glimpse. The, um, for This is one of the 30 sub-projects that I'm doing under this, and uh, people are helping with many other sub-projects, including our Kent Lightfoot. That in the big picture, I think what we are getting at is for California Northwest Coast, we do not see a major population decrease, and uh, uh, the big idea is that white food diversity really helped to maintain sustainable um, <coughs> subsistence settlement um, um, systems and uh, maintaining the community. Uh, for the Canadian Arctic, this is a much later period, but um, the case study from there indicates that loss of food diversity was followed by a major population increase. Uh, the, the other two sub-projects are, are not really dealing with the big picture. We are getting only a small portion of the big picture but for the Creoles and uh, Eastern Hokkaido, where uh, Ben Fitzhugh is working, um, he is really emphasizing social network is the key that when we see long distance trade, the population and um, the community resilience seems to be much higher. And Lake Baikal, um, <coughs> initially we thought we are dealing with um, <coughs> subsistence intensification and loss of food diversity, but uh, <coughs> Stable isotope data seems to indicate that actually there's more food diversity than expected. Uh, the, I'll just do the slideshow for the rest. Um, the, for the contemporary society, we're doing a lot of sub-projects, but um, here um, what we are getting is a lot of uh, <coughs> interesting interview results with an emphasis on traditional um, <coughs> environmental uh, ecological knowledge where um, <coughs> Um, people um, who are maintaining the knowledge with, um, which is also tied to food diversity, this is um, one of our interviews in the mountainous part of Japan. And uh, um, Japan, as I said, Japan is facing a major population decrease. And uh, um, rural parts um, are um, actually particularly severely hit by that. But about 10 years ago, a lot of people predicted that there will be a lot of villages that will be abandoned mm -hmm. in 10 years. And they are not abandoned, they are still there. Just the uh, average population um, age is getting higher, but some of the retired people went back to their hometowns. They are not disappearing. And in the meanwhile, um, there are a lot of um, uh, <coughs> expectations from uh, the local community people, what can we do to revive the communities? And one of the things that we are doing is to interview um, their traditional ecological knowledge and how things used to work. And this is a very good example of northern Japan where uh, <coughs> the mountainous area, no rice paddy field until the 1950s, and uh, they didn't have much cash, but they were never um, really in uh, <coughs> Uh, the situation where they had to go away during the winter to take wage labor, that they were able to maintain the community. And uh, um, 
we are also interviewing uh, about um, 20 farmers in Fukushima, where it turned out to be the central um, center of organic farming. And we initially thought this is a case where traditional ecological knowledge is not, was not good enough to maintain uh, <coughs> their uh, <coughs> subsistence activities. But in fact, traditional ecological knowledge and their ties to the land is what um, <coughs> keeps them going. It's also the thing to keep them still tied to the slightly contaminated area. So it's complicated, but um, <coughs> we were actually um, <coughs> quite excited to get solid interviews of farmers from this area. Uh, just to show you, I don't really have the time. A highlight of our project was when we invited a Squamish elder to an Ainu museum um, this spring and uh, did a, a, a basket making workshop that he said that basically making baskets starts with planting trees that the technique of weaving is only a small portion that's really maintaining the forest. And uh, um, to um, know which plant needs to be used in what way, that's really the main part of making basket. And uh, that well, went really well with um, our work of agroecology that Miguel Altieri and others are helping. That Miguel was basically telling us that making um, good soil is the core of um, <coughs> um, maintaining food diversity. It's not really growing plants and veggies per se. It's um, <coughs> the um, <coughs> soil quality is really what matters. So in the meanwhile, we do have a um, <coughs> group of people working on interviews of organic food production and comparing that with Japan. Uh, very quickly, uh, <coughs> Implementation, Outreach, and Policy Proposal Group. This is where um, we have um, groups of people working on actual implementation, um, outreach, and policy proposals. And when I said this, I didn't even know what policy proposal means, to be honest with you. I didn't even know where to start. But with the help of some local stakeholders, um, particularly in the Kitakami Mountains, um, we were able to um, work closely with some of the people who can actually influence um, what's happening in the region. Um, we also did a lot of workshops um, in relation to um, uh, archaeologists working on climate change, including those um, um, on the SAA Climate Change Committee. Um, as part of our project research, we did um, 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 get connected with IHOPE and uh, Carol Crumley um, put uh, our uh, um, project on the website. So if you go to their website now, our project is listed there. And uh, we also were able to put a WAC resolution um, in relation to our field work in Hokkaido and uh, impacts of dam construction. So um, we are considering developing an accord or set of principles to educate and guide um, <coughs> interaction between archaeologists and uh, extractive industries, including mining dams and energy development. This will be slightly modified, but it will be there. Uh, lots of different um, activities. Uh, we put um, uh, <coughs> Kyoto Agroecology Declaration, which is on the website of uh, the project. We did an acorn processing workshop with Wakcham Niyokut's people, and Kent and Rob are working on reviving local and traditional ecological knowledge uh, with Amamutsu people. So, um, in conclusion, I know that I talked so much that you're probably thinking Junko is totally crazy. <laughs> <laughs> But um, we got a lot of things done with our archaeology that I was able to clear all the um, uh, C14 dates, um, uh, pollen data, and uh, residue analysis that I wanted to do, but I didn't have enough money. Now I got pretty much everything cleared. And uh, um, uh, we got a lot of other sub-projects going on. And I think the best part of this project was that um, I was able to work with a large number of scholars who are concerned about contemporary issues and uh, um, who really think that archaeology can contribute to think about um, 
current issues in uh, the environment and society. So with that, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, Pat. It strikes me that uh, what you're doing has a lot of relevance to the old, uh, not so old, I mean, it goes back to Malthus, but Malthus is closer over time. Yes. Uh, but you didn't mention that at the top. But I think the last bad night I did that, and you didn't like that part. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 